Yeah, everybody on the other side can know someone who's going to be here in person. I mean, it looks like a snow day. Yeah, this is another instructor's room, and they they get pretty. Um, things are discombobulated, and then I hear about it because they complain. What else? Yeah, I know this is not my yeah. idea of the system. <laughs> and we get to in your own. Right. Yeah. It's kind of like saying, Catherine, yeah. are you ready for me to uh, start um, recording it? Yeah, go ahead. Because so Brittany yeah. is doing a pretty good job. Um, Let's see if that can do that yeah. over here. Yeah, I can read. That's good. Oh, the school? Not real. Let me just go down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Is that better? Okay, let's test it, make sure it's looking where it's supposed to. Perfect. What about sound? Yes. Can I get a thumb up, thumbs up from anyone if you can hear me on Zoom? I can hear you. This is Margaret. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Margaret. This is a little bit bigger than I yeah, that was fine too. yours. Anything else? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Two minutes only. Okay. <laughs> From the, the comfort of your chair, of your chair. I know you want other problems. This is okay. I did let Brittany know that there was. I figured I wouldn't be the only one who saw it. Slides are all there. I didn't know if they were still uploading. Or, or. Just be a note that you saw our room. 4-H got it. And I should have asked him to swap. Or didn't. Mm -hmm. I'll move over. What are you doing? Yeah, no. James is tired of me. He's walking. Here's Sax. And. 
Hey, there we go. Wait, I can walk up to this spot. Can you, can you tell them when they go, can I go in your pocket line for a minute? I think, oh, my God. Somebody had to ask. It's like, without fail. So should we be planting seeds this weekend in time for the so come back? So if we want to have them ready for any six about eight weeks. Yeah. Well, that's Right here. Probably in the wedding or something. Oh, holy crap. There was one vegetable on the list that said it could be potassium in the boost. Yeah, I know. That's why I go to some different and say, well, potatoes. What do you recommend about potassium? I would try to find something that's liquid and have a good quantity and support it on the and then the ones that are going to be much higher. So he gave us the recipe for a three seven one. That was pretty much about twenty twenty one. Some of that. Didn't try to realize it was so Through the slide show, it called for certain things. Well, that's what corn, onions. The soil doesn't know the difference between the corn oil and Uh, oh, my God. It's, it's yeah. like we have up. no whiteboard, which makes me happy. Oh, oh, uh, 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 I think it is. Soak your beans in water oh, okay. and then roll the beans in that in the okay. pan. Oh, okay. Yep. So, either way, it works. Okay. Yep. Huh. 
I've tried all sorts of different ways of inoculating yeah, kind of like an my machine machine plants, plants, yeah. there, so and there. And I have never found any one way to be better than another. So okay. the direct in the in the little furrow for the beans, <laughs> yeah. getting them moist, rolling them in it. Works. Well, I'm like, I'll open out. Getting the snacks for tomatoes. All I could focus on was My husband has done so many favors for me when I'm teaching. And I give him, I bring him chocolate. Okay. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, oh, I can think of this guy chocolate for Mark. I got to chocolate for Mark. So I got chocolate for everybody. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's enough. Uh, I didn't think anyone would complain. <laughs> I did get some some more tea for the tea for the curves. Yeah. Oh, that's it, baby. <laughs> 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 I think there's more tea drinkers and coffee drinkers in here. Yeah, like Thank you for that long. Yeah. 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 I would love to see the nursery in this. I can't. Well, there's there's new alternatives now. There's they're doing some really good stuff with tapioca and my first They're turning tapioca inside from a single plant, and it does break down over time. So I think that's pretty cool. We need to get away from this plastic stuff.
That's okay. When it comes to registering, yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that would be handy. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Master Gardener class. Tonight's program is on pesticides. And I've been teaching this particular topic now for 21 years. I don't teach you how to buy what chemical to kill what insect. So I'm going to teach you how these chemicals work and some of the consequences in them, of them. And then I'm going to give you alternatives to use. Again, this class really focuses more on a holistic, sort of an organic approach and IPM integrated pest management, where we start at the least toxic and then work our way up the scale. Typically, a few times to that there is a need for heavy handed insecticides. So I also have seeds. For those of you who are pepper and tomatoes, I will put these out and please take what you would like. By all means, grow some for yourselves and grow some for the plant sale. And you're welcome to take or share or whatever works the way up on a tomato and pepper plants, pepper seeds. Also got some new snacks and some tea. So yeah, I didn't exactly buy healthy snacks, but I did buy snacks. <laughs> yeah. So any questions or comments before we get going? I have, I have a question for you. Sure. It's not on the topic at all, but we were talking about tomato plants and raising tomato plants. No one, I know you have to push them back and stuff, but I don't know how you do that and when you do that to make a thicker root versus a skinny little stem. Yeah. yeah, so when they're getting, and I wouldn't exactly worry about pushing them back to the plant cell. Okay. Just let them, if you can get them about this tall, mm -hmm. the plant cell, that, that's about perfect. So now is the time to start them to see them. And it's really kind of up to the homeowner to do that. Yeah. Okay. Yes, the definition of a pesticide any chemical, natural or man made, has been designed to kill another organism. And that is kind of the Webster's dictionary definition of a pesticide. And pesticides, that's an umbrella term. And it also encompasses insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, and we'll go over a whole list of other sides that it covers. But the term pesticide is just a broad umbrella term. There are hundreds of thousands of pesticides in a natural environment. Biological warfare was invented and perfected in nature. Must be kept in mind that for every scary synthetic pesticide man has created, nature has created something worse. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's Isn't it though? So <laughs> I think this one's just hilarious. According to Dr. Bruce Ames, every plant produces roughly a few dozen toxins, some of which a high enough dose would be toxic to humans. For example, cabbage produces at least 49 known pesticides. Who knew, right? Who knew? Every time you eat that coleslaw or sauerkraut or kimchi, you know, <laughs> yeah, okay. it could kill me. Probably not. Okay, so a brief history on pesticides. Before World War II, and that is our benchmark time frame, before 
the 30s and 40s, pesticides were predominantly inorganic. We're talking about sulfur, lead, copper, arsenic, boron, mercury, botanical compounds, nicotine, erythrin, rhodonone. So nicotine is, is a pretty powerful insecticide. It's pretty amazing. And so nicotine is from the Solanacea family, so the nightshade family. It's also the same family from tomatoes, peppers, eggplants. So for people who can't eat those, that's that's part of why, is they're from that same family. Okay, so during this time, so DDT, everybody kind of associates DDT with America. But it's not true, it was the Swiss. The Swiss invented DDT. That's all their fault. Yeah. So it was it was extraordinarily effective. And a lot of other materials came off, spun off from it. Eldrin, chloridane, 2,4-D. We still use 2,4-D to this day. Oh, a lot of this around. I when I cleaned out my parents' house when I went through their estate, my dad still had a bottle of this, and he still had a bottle of lending. Yeah. I mean, he carried that stuff with him. He moved with it. He, my dad hated insects. <laughs> then they had, then, then I happened. Yeah, I don't know what happened to that, but very, very toxic and just horrible toxic stuff. Is there a way to get rid of that so that you're not putting it back in the soil? Yes, and I will get to that in the lecture. I don't leave that up. Yeah. I do not leave that up. So this is a chart from the EPA. So world and US pesticide expenditures. It's from 2007. It takes them a long time to get updated information. And I apologize, but I didn't really look to see if there was anything from 2013 or 2015. But you can see the world market back in 2007 that's that's huge. That's just absolutely huge. The U.S. market is is this little. It's more the yellow and gold. Wow. So from a, a standpoint of usage and expenditures, the United States doesn't use quite as much as everybody. You know that a lot of the environmentalists want us want you to think. Okay. So yeah, South America, Africa, Asia. Yeah, especially South America. Pesticide type I used 2012. Again, this is the EPA is not real fast on updating their stuff. But again, you can see that this is the US down here in total of all of these fungicides, fumigants, insecticides, herbicides. So we're we're not quite as bad. We could be better. And again, this is some more yeah, woman garden. Agriculture is, head, is held to a much higher standard when it comes to them using insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides. So they all have to go through a class, a very intense class. They have to take a test. So they have to be licensed. They have to be insured. Do I have any ag applicators in here Anyone with a license? Okay. So agriculture is held to a much higher standard. The label on the bottle is, the, is a federal law. And, and so they're held to that law that they have to read it. Homeowners are supposed to read that label, but the font is so stinking small that it's hard to read and you open it up and, and it's one of those gazillion fold things and it goes up like this. Yeah. And you're going, what? So homeowners have a tendency to not use it, but you can see insecticide-wise, homeowners actually use more insecticides than agriculture does. So this is this is another reason why I try to get you all off of that bandwagon and move you away from insecticides. This is one reason. Okay, so I said the label is the law, and you need to read the label. 
but a lot of times that label is hard to read and understand. So there's the active ingredient. And kind of for example, I'm going to pass this around. This is the main active ingredient in this is petroleum oil. Doesn't exactly say how refined it is or what it is. And then there's inert ingredients in there, but I'm going to pass it around for you to look at. And that's that's a insecticide to go after scale insects. And I'll also tell you, teach you tonight how to make your own insecticide for scale insects. So easy. Okay. The active ingredient, that's the main ingredient, that's the actual pesticide that's in there. Sometimes it might require more mixing, more diluting, and that's really where it gets difficult, especially if you have to dilute it. Malathion is one of those that's kind of notorious for a little tiny bottle, and then the tiny, you know, the two-point font that says that you need to dilute, you know, one milliliter to 100 milliliters, but, you know, it's hard to read that, right? And most of the time, the active pesticide chemicals are in a form which may or may not be suitable for direct application. So that's why, again, reading that label is really important. Has anybody ever reversed or diluted dilution ratio? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. And I have that yard falls on those, okay? <laughs> well, it says 50 to 1. Yeah, well, <laughs> right, 50 drops to one drop of water. But yeah, I had someone bring me in a jar with a ladybug larva, which looked ferocious. I mean, it looked like they're going to, you know, tear your tree apart. And she had just taken the chemical and went on the ladybug larva, and I rinsed the ladybug larva off and took it back outside. <laughs> Explain to her where it was. <laughs> She actually joined, became a master gardener. So. <laughs> okay. So, a lot of these chemicals, these insecticides, herbicides, pesticides, have a synergist in them. And that's where it's a chemical that, that causes another chemical to be more potent, more active. So, a really good example of this that, of course, is not talked about, but do I have any lawn care companies in here? I just want to make sure I don't get shot. <laughs> <laughs> so that when you see Chem Lawn or True Green come on, and it's 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 like an Olympic event. Man, they pull that hose out, they run around through the yard, and they're leaping over stuff, and then they put it all back and they scurry off. Well, that's an insecticide, a fungicide, an herbicide, and a fertilizer all mixed together in that pot. Well, a fungicide acts as a synergist to the insecticide. So the insecticide, where it might be very benign, now that fungicide acts synergistically is making that insecticide 10 times more potent. So it, it accelerates it in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're pretty amazing to watch. And I watch and I go, I really don't think they're doing any harm. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, with the presence of a synergist, a little active ingredient could go a long ways. So you might look at the bottle, read, read the label, right? And it might say, you know, 1.1% active ingredient. You're going, well, really? But there's a synergist in there that they're not talking about. And it, in their ingredients, it's making that active ingredient 10 times more potent. So that way the chemical company can get away with just adding a little, but putting an inexpensive synergist in there to make that more potent. So the synergist, piperonyl butoxide. This by itself is a registered insecticide. And it's derived from sesame seeds. Now, so it goes back to that first part of the opening part of the lecture tonight about how plants can be more deadly. <laughs> so sesame seeds, when they're broken down, become piperonyl butoxide chemically. And they're a synergist to pyrethrins, but also an insecticide by themselves. 
Okay, by federal law, the active ingredient must be identified by name on the label along with the percentage. So that bottle of petroleum oil that's being passed around with this for scale insects, you know, you can see the, the active ingredient and then the inert ingredient on there. So inert ingredients. One thinks of inert as being like, you know, the top of the table, right? The floor, you know, it's inert, it doesn't move, right? Except when it's in, when it's used as a pesticide or some other chemical application. And then it can also act as a synergist or a carrier or a surfactant. So it makes it or makes it stick better. It can also prevent caking or foaming. A lot of times that in their ingredients an anti-foaming. So if you add two together and it foams in, in a well, <laughs> or you mix it with water and it foams, that is where the inert ingredient comes in to help prevent that foaming, extend the shelf life. Uh, herbicides, there'll be a surfactant on there that helps you penetrate the, the leaf tissue of the plant so that they're more effective. So some inert ingredients, xylene, methylparaben. So you gotta, it, it's not listed. You know, as that bottle goes around and you see the word inert ingredient, it doesn't tell you anything. A lot of times those inert ingredients are considered trade secrets. So it's not gonna be listed on there. And you have to do some pretty deep internet research to find these. And, and some of them are like, wow, who knew? Dimethyl ether, butane, really? Butane. <laughs> so, so this is the one, this took me a long time to find this one. Polyethyl oxalated calamine. Yeah, there's a pronunciation test at the end. But that's your inert ingredient in Roundup. And it's, this ingredient is extremely toxic. That's what makes Roundup so, so carcinogenic, is that polyethyl oxalated tallow amine. And this is the one you've got to be really, really careful with, and you want to wear gloves, probably long sleeves when you handle Roundup. You do have to be very careful handling Roundup. Again, it's like, read the label. The label will tell you to do all that. Put the we'll put the blue nitrile gloves on. Don't use the yellow dishwashing gloves. The nitrile gloves will prevent the insecticides or herbicides from penetrating to your skin. Well, the next with the top two holiday advertisers because we have a guy out there putting away no protection, nothing. Mm -hmm. But if, if they had a guy out there wearing all the, the correct personal protection equipment, you know, the gloves, the protective glasses, <laughs> everybody would freak out and no one would buy it. You know, I mean, well, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> of course, the farmers wouldn't be happy, but. <laughs> well, I actually don't have any problems with Roundup, and I, and I will recommend to use it, depending upon the situation and the time of this time of the year. Because weeds, trying to kill weeds, that they have a, weeds have a whole different physiology, and and they're there to survive, so they're harder to knock down. I have no problems with ground up. Just have to know how to use it. Wear gloves. Wear long sleeves. Right. Protect yourself. Okay. So I talked about how the word pesticide is this umbrella term. But there's also other sides out there. There's arachnicides, there's attractants. Attractants work pretty well. They don't kill the insect. There's also repellents, which of course tell the bug or critter to go away. Avicides, there's actually an avicide out there for birds. Um, pigeons, typically, starlings, or what those are targeted for. So I highlighted bacteria sides. And if you've noticed that when you buy 
dish soap for your kitchen. At one time it said, you know, it kills 99.9% .9 of all germs. Well, it was an antibiotic, essentially. And so everybody, every day was using this antibacterial and kind of 0.1% was causing, also causing problems. So if you look at those, that have, they have since pulled that bacteria side out. The fungicides, herbicides, insecticides, and then they're further classified by functions. So attractants, um, attractants um, work really well if you've got fruit. I mean, that sounds weird, right? You, why would you want to bring an insect in? So attractants usually with their, what well, can either be like a little tent with a hormone in there, pheromone in there, or um, a round ball with pheromones on them. For, for all of us who like to grow raspberries and strawberries, we have a little fruit fly called the spotted wing drosophila. And it's a little tiny, it almost looks like a fungus snap. You don't know you've got those problems until you go to get that raspberry. You look at it on Monday and go, yeah, yeah, tomorrow it's going to be perfect and I'm going to eat it. And you get to it on Tuesday morning and all of a sudden it's kind of looks like it's melted. Well, that's the spotted wing Drosophila. And she has laid her eggs on that raspberry on those fruits. And those little individual fruits are called droops, right? From Latin. And she lays her eggs on there. The eggs hatch into these little larvae and the larvae break through this, um, the membrane and get down into the fruit and start to eat, eat that soft fruit. And enough of them and all of a sudden the fruit just turns to mush. So you don't know you've got the spotted ring or softball until you see that. You know, in the meantime, you know, you're merrily going through your raspberry patch, right? PJ, I can see, I can see what you're looking for. <laughs> That's a little protein with your raspberry, right? <laughs> so you put out an attractant. And this little jar has got some holes in the top, and you just hang it near the raspberries. You can you can make these yourself. The red party cups work. And so there's holes in it. The, the little insect can figure out how to get in, but they can't find the door to get back out. And you put some water in here and you put some fruit so that the fruit starts to ferment. And it's an attractant to the spotted wing drosophila. So this is a very cool, all natural, no insecticide way to get rid of them. Or at least control them. They're, they're a tough one. They're a real tough one. Um, repellents, it's something that's going to tell that animal to go away. I've had master gardeners work, you know, try the deer repellents and the raccoon repellents, and it always comes back with mixed reviews, real mixed reviews. Yeah. So I, I, I just discovered that I have a herd of like 24 white tailed deer that are living in my neighbor's windbreak, but coming over to my alfalfa field. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, really? <laughs> I, I can think of other repellents to use than chemical ones, but the lead one. Yeah. 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 So I grew up in Wisconsin, and I think the best thing in the world is smoked deer venison summer sausage. Oh, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, that's I'm glad Mike and Bryce brought that up. So Mike is saying that you can take a, a loofah sponge and what do you do? Just melt the soap for in it? Yeah. So Mike is saying um, ivory soap, um, Irish spring dial, you know, all those can repel hair. I've heard people use hair. So there's there's a bunch of ways, but in your vegetable garden, it's one thing, but in an 80 acre alfalfa field, it's I'm thinking the dogs and some lead, but you know, I gotta get a tag first. Hey, desiccants. 
The desiccants are interesting, and this is diatomaceous earth, and it's called DE, and you can you can go to just about any place and get DE. Murdoch sells it, um, s and Organics down in um, Hereford sells it. There's a lot of places you can get it. I've, I've got like a 50 pound bag of it. I was trying to get rid of the loop of worms eating my cabbage, and it was just cheap that way. The diatomaceous earth, if you were to look at it underneath the microscope, is the skeletonized remains of diatoms. And so under a microscope, it looks like glass. This works on insects that are dry, like aphids. And so as they crawl across diatomaceous earth, it abrades their body and they leak out. They just dehydrate. It doesn't work on slimy bodies, like, you know, like slugs. So it's got to be a dry insect. Okay, then pass through. This is a one that spreads a livestock, usually in the summer to help control flies. So the, the idea is that it's, the product is called Raybon comes in a big molasses tub and the, the horse, the cattle, whatever, lick it, goes through its pass-through, so it's now in their manure, which is another reason why you want to be very careful when you use manure in a, don't want to use manure in a vegetable garden, right? But if you do, you know, know what that person has been feeding those animals, because now you've got an insecticide in the manure that's there to kill fly larvae. So again, read the label, see what else it kills, because my bet is it's going to kill off-target insects also. So be very careful with that. Systemics, I, I do like using systemics. I do recommend using systemics for non-flowering trees and shrubs. So think you like your pine trees, trees that there's uh, elm trees and hazelnut trees bloom in February. It's a Inconspicuous, although this year could be different. That's an inconspic inconspicuous flower. You're not going to see it. They're wind pollinated. You know, I'm sure that pollen gets blown to Nebraska, but um, systemics are absorbed through the root system or the trunk of the tree or the plant. And then the plant pulls it up and it goes through every aspect of that, that plant, that tree. So it goes all the way out to the far needles or leaves. And so it's very effective for anything that's trying to chew on that, that plant or eat that plant or drill into that plant. The only downside is that if, if an insect's already trying to drill through the tree, it's already causing damage. But once it gets to that foam or xylem level and gets into that systemic insecticide, it kills it. So it's, it's, it's easy to use. This is a imidacloprid as a rule. You mix it with water and you pour it literally at the base of the tree or shrub or on the trunk. And so you're not spraying it into the environment. Anytime you have to start spraying chemicals into the environment, you're gonna get non-target animals, non-target insects, you're gonna get yourself, anything else that's around there. So this is, this is why I like using it. Cause you just add it to water, you just dump it at the base of the tree and you're good for a year, a whole year. I run into people that just want to be slaves to their garden and their, and they think they need to go out there and you know gear up and spray everything, but you know, go go do something fun instead. <laughs> okay. Classified by function. Growth regulators, that tells an insect that it can grow, but its outer shell, the exoskeleton, can't grow with it. And so the growth regulator says, grow, but the shell says, I can't let you grow. And so the insect essentially gets squeezed to death by its own shell, by its own exoskeleton. Contact poisons, stomach poisons, Stomach poisons are interesting. Um, they are, as they say, dust, baits, aerosols, and fumigants. 
So this is this is a bait for everybody who doesn't like grasshoppers, right? We all want grasshoppers in our garden, right? No. So this is called no low bait. And this is Nosema locustii. It's a biological insecticide. The Nosema is essentially put on a bait, which is um, garden. You know, and I'll pass this around and I'll make a mess of the floor. But it's just bar in place and it's infused with this Nosema. And it's non toxic to people. Like chickens have eaten it. You know, I'm sure a few other critters have eaten it, but it's non toxic from barley. It only is effective on the target insect, and that's the grasshopper and one of the critters. When I, when I use this, I'm going to dump this back in here. It's only good for one year, which is why that's here because I didn't use the whole bag. It took out, I, there was, we had a year where it was a really bad grasshopper infestation. <laughs> and I put this out within 24 hours, over 50% of grasshoppers were dead. Now, this is kind of stomach poison in the way it works. And that the nocema will multiply in the insect gut and kills, it shuts the guts down. And, and kind of an interesting thing is grasshoppers can be cannibalistic. Okay. And so there's a dead grasshopper, and so the live grasshopper goes over and eats the dead grasshopper and also eats the no tuna and then dies. So it, it works without a lot. It, it does my job for me without me having to do a lot of work. Okay. Are you saying that that's not effective anymore because it's over here? Yeah, it's got a short lifespan. You got a roll out. Yeah, that's what I think. I can't leave you alone when you go. I just keep feeding you the last time. That's not awesome. I don't want to no, kill them. But that, you have to mail order that. You can't, you can't buy it as a rule. And it's just so much more benign to use that than using seven. And you just you just take it literally, take one. Put your hand in there, put the oil on if you want, and then just squirt it out and grab top of the and that's it. You're not spraying anything, you're not putting chemicals into the air. You said it lasts for about a year. The, the bag itself, the oh, contents okay. in the bag last for about a year. Okay. How much you going to do? So, so the modes of modes of action. Contact where you have to directly spray that insect has to have that chemical directly onto it. Um, neem oil is one of those. As a doctor indica, you have to directly put that neem oil onto the insect to be effective. Um, stomach poison has to eat it, like the nosema locustiida and cassiana. Stomach poison, plant takes it up, and then the plant defends itself more efficiently. A lethal dose. This is kind of this is theoretically okay. This is the theory. The fifty percent, the LD fifty, is that a given substance. Is going to kill 50% of the target pests. So it's like the nosema that I fed to the grasshoppers. In 24 hours, it took out 50% of the grasshoppers. The LD50 rating is usually expressed in milligrams of poison per kilogram of body weight, which means that one milligram per kilogram of each individual or group of 150 pound men consume approximately 6.8 milligrams of the pesticide, presumably half the individuals will die immediately. That's the theory behind LD50. And that's the benchmark, as, as grim as that description is, 
That's the benchmark number for rating insecticides. There are so the smaller the number, the more toxic they are. And there are some insecticides used in the greenhouse industry that have an LD of five. So when the people use that, they are totally geared up with um, an outside air system. And they go in there and that usually that greenhouse is shut down for 48 hours. So the bigger the number, the least toxic it is. But to kind of give you an example, laundry bleach, very toxic, it tastes to a teaspoon. You know, how many of you know that bleach was toxic? And yeah, yep, there you go. Rubber, I put rubber cement in here because I can think of all the little, you know, the high school boys, you know, when they would put rubber cement on their hand and then roll it off into a ball and then eat it <laughs> to gross out the little girls. You know, only a boy would do that, right? I missed that as a child. Oh, <laughs> rubber cement. Yeah, 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 yeah. Airplane, air, the old fashioned airplane is This is when my brother was the their way of getting high. You could put it in a plastic bag. Oh, okay. Yeah, and you breathe it in. Real great for the boring. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, rubber oh, cement. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, a teaspoon to a tablespoon, liquid detergent, an ounce to a pint. I don't know who would ever drink that much. And then, of course, baby lotion. So there's there's a number, an LD50 number for everything out there. And then also on these labels, there's going to be a, there also will be a category on there of indicating that level. They may not put the LD50 number on there, but they should, but they have to have this on there. So danger, highly hazardous, poisonous, that should be like the skull and crossbones, warning, moderately hazardous, and then caution, slightly hazardous to relatively non-hazardous. It's kind of like this for the insecticide, the scale you know, it's petroleum oil, we certainly want to drink that, but you never know. So this is what they look like on the label. And, and again, read the label, it has a lot of really boring information on it that's very important. So this, I've had some pretty interesting phone calls over the last 21 years. Lady calls and goes, I used fertile loam systemic drench for trees and shrubs last year on my fruit trees. So now remember systemic has taken up through the roots and it gets all the way out through the leaves, everything, the buds, and it's good for a year. It lasts for a year. This year it has a large harvest of fruit. In this case, it was peaches. I'm concerned the fruit is not fit for consumption because it may contain pesticide. However, it would be a shame to let it go to waste, but I obviously don't want to eat toxic fruit. And I asked her, I said, well, did you read the label? No. <laughs> so I pull it up on, online, read the MSD sheet, and it is not safe to use on peaches. So I had to tell her to throw away all the peaches. How would you safely dispose of those peaches? I didn't I didn't advise her on that. I, I left her in that in that mode. You you can take it to you know here in Cheyenne, you could take it to them and let them know and they could dispose of it for you. Yeah. <laughs> Or you could so if you use this stuff on non flowery trees, so were the needles toxic? Like a pine tree? They should die before another button, a bird eats them or something else eats them. So I don't think they get into the environment that way. Yeah. Yeah, the whole mountain pine beetle epidemic, oh, that was bad. 
That was bad. It was, it came down to if you didn't spray your trees, you would lose your trees. It was that bad. And there was all sorts of snake oil products out on the market. There was one that was supposedly came up by a couple of professors down at CSU, and it was concentrated shellfish extract. You only need a little bit, and it would cause the tree to push out the insect. It would cause the tree to sap more and push the insects out. And like, we're in a drought, right? You know, Where's that tree gonna find the energy to sap something out if it doesn't have enough water to do that? And so they kind of left that little important thing out that you know, if you're not watering your trees, this isn't gonna work. But they made a lot of money. Oh my gosh, they made a lot of money off of it. Snake oil. Oh, on Dave on the grasshoppers. I'm not sure what part you didn't hear me talk about. I'm sorry, I move around a little too much. Okay, pesticides in the human body, routes of entry. So, a number of years ago, I did a yard call where the, we're on like 10 acres and we're walking and looking at all of his trees. And on his hip, there's a retired law enforcement guy. So on his hip, he's carrying a spray bottle of seven. No hand protection, no nothing. He's wearing shorts and he's got this bottle of seven on his loop. And he's going, you point out a bug to me and I'll kill it. <laughs> so brought some pesticide entry. Your skin, dermal exposure. You can breathe, you can drink it, right? So he had a glass of iced tea. One hand was seven, the other hand was a glass of iced tea. So, you know, there's going to be cross contamination there. And of course, breathing it in. If you're spraying it and you're not wearing an N95 mask or some sort of face protection, you're going to be breathing this stuff in. So the human body has different rates of absorption. So your scalp, you know, when you think about you're outside and you're working and, you know, I'm always trying to push my hair off my face. So your scalp, your forehead, you know, your ear, behind the ear, the drive, they all have different rates of absorption from slow to fast. And it always surprises me at, you know, how, did they do this research, but it was done back in 1988 and they have changed since then. So my caveat is always, gentlemen, please wash your hands before you go to the bathroom, okay? Just saying. Oh yeah, exactly. Uh, your eyes are highly absorbing of stuff. Yeah. But yeah, they didn't they didn't include that. Anyway. Okay, so the LD of some insecticides. And again, remember LD50 is the benchmark number, and it can either be more toxic and have a smaller number, or it can be least toxic and have a bigger number. And so nicotine is is hugely toxic. There was a product on the market for a long time called Black Flag. Yep. And that got pulled from the market because of misuse. Seven has an LD of 850. So it's seven is pretty darn toxic. It is pretty potent. And a lot of people think that, well, I bought it at Walmart, so it should be safe, right? Mm -hmm. Malathion, that's also pretty darn toxic, the perithrins. And then you get into neem oil. And neem oil is naturally derived from the azadactrin tree. And neem oil, you can find neem in um, hair shampoo, you can find it in toothpaste, you can find it in lotions. Yeah, it's an herb. Right, safe, right? Probably not. 
but it has a pretty high LD number. So it's, it makes it least toxic of all the choices on that. Okay, some people problems. And this is, you know, the, the gentleman that was running around with a seven bottle on his hip, when he finally got done walking that 10 acres and looking at all his trees, I started to talk to him about the people problems. So a lot of these chemicals, these insecticides are neurotoxins, and that interferes with the cholinesterase enzyme between your, your, your nerves. And it causes, it, it, it prevents, it gets rid of that. The cholinesterase is kind of like the traffic cop. And so it, it inhibits that. And it causes the nerves to fire rapidly. And so insects literally will shake themselves to death. And for people, it's like drinking too much caffeine. Like you just got up and you had, you know, the whole pot of espresso. Mm -hmm. It causes you to just do this. So it's also gone back, and this is from the 99th US Congress, no toxicity identifying the controlling poisons of the nervous system. So if you're looking for some not so light reading, here it is. Here's the book. And they have been able to acquaint it back to Parkinson's and Alzheimer's because of how it interferes with that cholinesterase enzyme in the nervous system. And this is why wearing gloves and protecting yourself is so important. Right, again, I'm not gonna teach you how to mix what chemical to kill what bug, but I'm gonna tell you to be really careful if you have to use the, the hard stuff and, and how to protect yourself. Okay, a lot of pesticides are hormone mimics. Um, herbicides especially are gonna be hormone mimics. Said no one ever, oh yeah, I want this to mess with my hormones, <laughs> especially women, oh my God. <laughs> uh, Yeah, and so you have to do very, be very careful with these because again, they do interfere with people at the hormonal level. So they're also going to mess with the animals, you know, your birds. So, so it does have this ripple effect in the environment. Okay, some symptoms you've gotten insecticide poisoning. Yeah, you know, this sounds just like. A flu, right? Fatigue, headache, dizziness, nausea, mild physical distress, muscle weakness, difficult breathing. You know, that's that's hard one to take. Um, apprehension, twitching, tremors, confusion, convulsions. We put this in to again a yard call several years ago. We have, we have an insect here called the sawfly, and they lay an egg that morphs into a larva called a pear slug. It's not a real slug, it's just a larva, but it moves around and looks like a slug. It likes to get on cotoneasters and a few other plants, but it really likes cotoneasters and it will skeletonize the leaf. So it looks really bad. It's a cosmetic issue. But the yard core is on. I, I, I guess this guy thought that the plant would miraculously heal itself and the leaf tissue would come back. Okay. So we'll watch around, watch around, and it's this little cute little dog, a little tiny thing, little white fluffy thing that's following us around. And you know, we looked at all the plants. I'm talking to him about, you know, what have you used? And looked at it. And so he had two different bottles of orthene with different manufacturing labels on it, but he never read the label, he didn't read what the active ingredients were. So he'd literally gone out and sprayed his shrubs twice with orthene, but he had this dog with him the whole time and he sprayed his dog. And the dog was exhibiting signs of twitching tremors, convulsions, confusion. And so he took the vet dog to the vet, but he didn't the guy didn't tell the vet that he had been spraying insecticides. And a thousand dollars later, a thousand dollar vet bill later, dog Got better. 
And I told him, you know, I looked at the labels and I explained to him what the symptoms were, because I already knew, I already knew what was going on. I told him the symptoms and he looked at me and says, oh my gosh, I poisoned my daughter. If he had, if he had read the label, he would have saved himself a thousand dollars. Or if he called me first, right? Um, yeah, I, during the pine beetle epidemic, I had a, a, a chemical app, you know, pesticide applicator call me to spray in pine trees. Because again, if, if he didn't, that was one of the few times he didn't spray the danger trees. And he's going, he had me on the phone and he's got, I've got a baby squirrel in my hand and it's twitching and going into convulsions. And I said, it's, it's insecticide poisoning. And he goes, oh my God. And he goes, oh, the squirrel just died. And he was in tears. And, hung up. <laughs> and my first thought is, it's just a squirrel. <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's a soft touch, how nice. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Insecticidal modes of action. This is how they work, the different ways that they can work. Nerve poisons. So we just talked about that, how they interfere with the flowing esterase enzymes. Muscle poisons, physical toxins, and pellets. So different, different modes of action, depending upon the insects you're going after and what, what will actually knock them down. So again, synaptic poisons act by interrupting the normal synaptic transmission of the nervous system, but shakes itself to death. Axonic poisons interrupt normal, normal axonic transmission of the nervous system, pyrethroids, chlorinated hydrocarbons, they're still being manufactured. Uh, Antichloronesterase, um, organophosphates, carbamates, um, choline mimics nicotine and nicotine sulfates. So again, you really have to read that label and not just take it for granted that it's going to be okay to use. Typically anymore, they've taken orthine off the market. Typically now you can really only get um, seven and malathion. But again, there, there still has a level of toxicity that you've got to respect. So physical toxins, they block the metabolic process, oils, that's a suffocant, dormant oils again. So that, that bottle that I, that jug I passed around, the pollen oil, this is for scale insects. So fruit trees, shade trees, ornamentals, and evergreens. Again, guys, the font on here is horrible. It's hard to read, but it's going to tell you what insects it's going to go after. And this is pretty much just for scale insects. And scale insects are those guys that have a hard outer shell and they kind of, you know, attach to the tree, the, the thin bark of the tree. You know, aspen trees are notorious for having scale. Um, lilacs, ash trees. Right? If I see scale on those guys, I know they're stressed, and that's why they've got them. But but this works by as a suffocant. So you spray it on there and it suffocates the little insect, right? Because you know, if you go back to the insect class with Scott, you know that insects have spiracles along the side of their body and they breathe through those spiracles. And so those dormant oils clog the spiracles and so they suffocate. If you've got scale on your trees, take some um, liquid detergent, liquid, liquid um, kitchen soap. Yeah, whatever. But whatever, whatever fragrance you like the best. <laughs> Palm olive, dawn, whatever. Yeah, whatever color. They're they're all the same. They're just you know different label on. <laughs> and you can mix that with, um, you know, take like take a, a half cup of the liquid detergent and put it in like a cup of water, so it's gonna be fairly thick. And stir that up and you put it on a sponge and you just sponge it on the scale. That easy. So scale, insects, we, we don't always know when they're gonna emerge. And so they've got this little shell, right? 
So they're on the tree and they've got this shell. And the shell lifts up ever so slightly. And these little scales, these little crawlers come out. And then they go, they don't go very far, and then they reattach, and then they grow, and they become big scales, right? So that's how those guys work. And so that dormer all you set was essentially preventing them from crawling out or suffocating them. They can emerge usually in a warm spell, sometime in the spring. And so you really have to be very watchful of the weather and know that where the scale is at on your trees. And so when it's got a couple of warm days, you know, it looks like it's gonna be warm for a couple of weeks, that's where you go out and you treat that, that plant. So I had a lady bring me in a sample of a twig that had scale in it and she put it in her purse. But she left it in her purse and carried it around her purse for about a week. And she brought it into the office and she had her two kids with her, with her. And so we sat down and I looked at it under a little handheld lens. And I'm like, oh, look at guys, their scale is emerging. And so I had the kids all looking at the scale crawling out from underneath the mother shell. She was as white as a sheet that there was bugs crawling around in her purse. <laughs> and she kind of picked up her purse and went like this. <laughs> <laughs> I, all I think of is, oh, that purse is destined for the trash bin. <laughs> but you can hatch them out in your purse, okay? Just saying, you know. Okay. So repellents. Again, they're just going to push that insect away. They're going to tell that insect to go someplace else. And, you know, we don't know where else that is, what that means. So you're going to repel them, you know, think about mosquito repellents, you know, you're telling them the mosquitoes to go away, so they're going to go to you instead, right, you're not wearing the right repellent. Uh, DEET, developed by the USDA, patented by the Army in 1946, so it has been around for a long time, registered for use by the public in 1957, so the Army used it for 11 years first and decided it was safe for the general public. Broad spectrum, pellon effective against mosquitoes, biting flies, chiggers, fleas, and ticks. So it's, it's very effective. When it's used correctly, but it's gotten kind of a bad rap because the product gets misused. And so here again, I, I have watched some parents just about dip their children in DEET. <laughs> and so that's that's where it becomes a misuse. But it's got over, it's got a kind of a long, long track record of, of being very safe to use. But again, it's like you gotta read the label and use it correctly. Okay. Two main chemical groups, inorganic and carbon-based, so inorganic pesticides in the stable, water-soluble, boric acid, borates, copper, sulfate, syrup, silica, aerogel, stomach poison, sodium hypochlorate. Um, so, boric acid and borates, so think 20 mule team borax. You can go to the grocery store and there it is, a little box of premium tea up there. That can be fairly effective against ants. You mix it with a little sugar and, and sprinkle it on ant pills. They take it down and it acts as a stone poison. Silica aerogel, those are those little packets you find in bottles of vitamins, those little tiny packets, or packets that are trying to keep something dry. So this stuff, dehydrates by pulling moisture out. And a lot of times this is used or there had been used the silica aerogel for um, uh, kind of an all natural, non-toxic way of controlling cockroaches. I didn't think anything could take out a cockroach, but cockroaches are weird. Yeah. I mean, they're really weird. Yeah. 
And cockroaches actually have their own parasites. They have lice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they deserve to have They're something like that, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have yeah. no Okay, carbon-based also compounds which sometimes contain hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphate, or sulfur. That's the majority of all our modern pesticides, so they all contain something like that in there. Okay, so some more carbon-based pesticides. And actually, I should be I should be titled kind of insecticides. Uh, organophosphates, malathion, paraffin, diazinon. That is not used to be added to um, fertilizers, lawn fertilizers. They've since pulled that off the market. You know, it's no longer manufactured, but anything that's still out there can be sold. It just was the non target insects and animals, that was a real problem with non target. Um, seven, chlorinated hydrocarbons, DDT, chlordane, eldrin, dieldrin. Uh, you can't buy them here in the United States anymore, but they're still manufactured and they're shipped overseas. So we don't allow them to purchase in the U.S. We allow them to manufacture in the U.S. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it's used. The DDT is still used a lot down in South America. Used to be used a lot in Africa to control mosquitoes, but it's not allowed there anymore. So, organophosphates. These are all byproducts of chemical warfare in World War II. So, when we talk about be careful when you use these, it's because they weren't originally developed to go after insects, they were developed to go after people. But we've just scaled it down into a dilute form to go after insects. But that's not to say there still isn't people problems or environmental problems with them. So a malathion. And some of these take a long time to break down too. And it depends upon the how much sunlight they're exposed to how much rain or lack of rain, the soil, soil pH. But as a rule, my malathion takes a year for 75% of it to break down. So it's persistent in the environment. And the EPA lists these as all very highly, acutely toxic to bees, wildlife, and humans. Again, EPA. Yes, yes, yes. They're trying to make a point. <laughs> and, and yeah, that's from the EPA. So, but it's like, you know, if you didn't take the Master Gardener class, you wouldn't know about this, right? Because it's, because you have to read, you have to read the label and then you have to find that book and try to slug your way through that book. But when you look at the font on this, it's just really difficult. This is just petroleum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's all the word on the fine print. But this is one reason why um, some of these are off the market. And diazinon, highly toxic to birds. Product life, non persistence, so it breaks down very quickly. But again, it was causing a lot of problems, so they pulled it, fortunately. Seven, again, this is a nerve toxin. Again, be very careful with it. Coral nicotinols, synthetic version of nicotine. Again, it's a, it's a nervous system disruptor. Then there's um, a new derivative of it, it's imidacloprid. And again, I will tell homeowners to use imidacloprid. It's, um, they changed the name, it's called BioAdvanced. And again, it's, again, it's a systemic, so the plant takes it up. And it's really good on non flowering trees and shrubs. There is some thought 
And, and actually there's a really good case where they, they believe that the neonicotinoids are pulled up into the um, flowers and end up in the nectar or the pollen of the flowers. And so it becomes very toxic to bees. And there was a case back in Oregon, not too far from the Xerces headquarters. And the Xerces headquarters is a environmental advocate group for invertebrates. This happened not too far from the headquarters where a licensed lawn care company went out and sprayed the linden trees when they were in full bloom for insects. Well, the linden tree in full bloom is going to attract every insect that, that is hungry because it, it's a supporter for bees, native bees, butterflies, a whole bunch of other insects. But this company went out and sprayed the trees and so they had they had just thousands of bees to walk into the ground dying. And of course, the Xerxes, which is just around the corner, just had a fit. And they went out and literally netted all the trees to keep the bees from going into those mm -hmm. lindens. So it really gave the minocloprid and the neonicotinoids just a huge bad name just because someone, someone did not read the label. <laughs> Not related. Okay, causes blockage in the type of neural pathways. Again, so it's a um, neurotoxin to insects, but it doesn't it doesn't impact warm blooded animals. And so, if you look at the flea and tick collars that you can buy for your dogs and cats, that is the active ingredient in those flea and tick collars is is imidacloprid or one of the neonicotinoids. But it's just so benign and it's so low toxic that that's really a very good use for it, very good place for it. Okay, talked about that. Okay, pyrethrum, pyrethrin, pyrethroid, and pyrethrin. Right? Mm. I, I can't even remember all of that. Pyrethrum and its derivatives refers to the dried powdered flower heads of the plant pyrethrum rosium. Chrysanthemum Hosea. You can grow these. You can grow your own chlorethrin. And it's one of the most important insecticides ever developed. It has been around for hundreds of years. It's only persistent in the environment for a few hours, which is really important. So the long, so the shorter time that it's available in the environment, the faster it breaks down, the better it is for non-target things. People, animals, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, now, some insects can detoxify erythrin and recover. So, this is why that synergist comes in. And that's where um, piperonyl butoxide is added to pyrethrin, is it so that insect can't detoxify and recover? Um, this is pyrethroids or synthetic, more toxic to insects. So again, you've got to read the label because they're also toxic to bees. These pyrethroids may last 10 days or longer in the environment. And it depends again, how fast they break down by how much sunlight, how much rain, moisture, lack of soil pH. So there's a lot of factors to how fast it can break down in the environment. Permethrin, another synthetic pyrethroid. It's been around since 73. Used on nursery stock, cotton and corn. Cotton and corn are two of the most sprayed, heavily sprayed crops in the world because of the amount of insects that want to go after them. And cotton growers constantly are monitoring and scouting for weevils. And if they so much as see one, they will start to spray. And it's available for home use. Lasts for three days in the environment. The methrin, toxic to honeybees and other beneficial insects. So almost all of these are going to be toxic to these insects. And a lot of times with just your butterflies, if you can smell that chemical in the air, that's all it's going to take to kill that butterfly. 
or some of the native bees. It's it's that potent and they're that sensitive to it. So you have to be very careful. And that's why spraying is can be so detrimental okay, to you and the environment. However, the good the good insects, your good bugs, haven't really developed resistance. Researchers don't know why, but the bad bugs like cockroaches, head lice, tobacco bloodworm, and to name like a few of the many, have all developed resistance. So if you kill off 100 and you still have 10 left that just survived it, those 10 are going to morph into a thousand and they're all going to be resistant to the insecticide. So it really creates some, some serious problems. Um, the two, the uh, red spider mites are, are resistant to everything. Thrips are resistant to everything. So there's there has been some problems. Rocky Mountain Poison Center, National Pesticide Information Center, so important numbers. And hopefully you never have to call any of these people. A persistence. So eventually all these pesticides break down into their original compounds, some hydrogen, carbon, oxygen. We'd like to have them all be short-lived so they break down in hours or a few days. Some of the other ones, um, the DDT, Vialdron, Lindrain, those are, we still don't know when they're gonna break down. They're still persistent in the environment to this day. So resurgence, this is where, again, that bad bug develops resistance. And, but at the same time, you've removed all the good guys. And so when the predators parasitize the pathogens that would normally control the pest, you temporarily removed, they drastically removed the numbers. Then you have this resurgence. And all of a sudden, again, you go from, from 10 to 10,000 bad bugs. Aphids are another one of those where they develop resistance very, very quickly, which is why we recommend green lace wings, ladybugs, you know, the, the bugs that are going to eat them. There's a whole plethora of bugs that want to eat, eat uh, aphids, including earwigs. Yeah, I know. That's like, there's a use for earwigs. Yeah, they like to eat aphids. So that's resurgence, where you take out the good guys and now the bad guys don't have any control and they just multiply, it. so it becomes worse. So resistance. Insects are some of the most adaptive creatures on the planet. When you think about cockroaches and how they've been able to survive, I mean, they're, we call it Jurassic, right? So, so they've been around and they've adapted and survived and um, there's a, there's a, an arachnid, it's not a spider, it's an arachnid called a centrifugid or a sun scorpion. And they're indigenous here to Wyoming. And they're long, they have eight legs, and they go really fast. <laughs> they're really fast. I don't know why the word slow fugit is in there because they're anything but slow. They're like little speed racers on the floor. And, and they're, they're actually a pretty cool arachnid for an arachnid. And they, they'll actually take care of their babies and they'll carry their babies along with them on their backs. And so I mean, they're, they're very fascinating, but they're Jurassic. They're very Jurassic. So they've adapted to the environment, managed to survive 400 million years by adapting, right? There are over 500 pest species that, ex that exhibit some level of resistance to at least one type of insecticide. So they're, they're masters at adaptation. Then there's this thing called biomagnification. And this starts out pretty benign, but it builds up over time. So in this case, this is a, a, a case out in Florida where they were spraying DDT and got in the water way. And so the plants took it up, but it was only at point. 0.4 parts per million, so pretty small. 
But then you've got the primary consumers of this plant would come by and they would eat this plant. So now they're eating not just one plant, which had just 0.04 parts per million, but they're eating many of them. So that starts to accumulate in their body. And so now this consumer of this plant has 0.23 parts per million of DDT in it. Then the secondary consumer comes along and eats the little fish, right? The big fish eats the little fish. And, and pretty soon this bigger fish has got 2.0 parts per million. So then the osprey came along and was eating these guys. And this also happened with the brown pelican down in Florida. And now it's got 13.8 parts per million of DDT in it. And it's not, it was enough to start killing off those birds. And it was because the DDT was getting into the waterway and being taken up by the aquatic plants. So that's called biomagnification. Okay, when and how to apply. Spot spray when possible. Avoid repeat spraying. So I, got, I need to back up on this one. Know what you're spraying. Know that insect that you're spraying. And sometimes trying to ID for bugs is challenging. A lot of ways to ID them now. We got some better applications for that. Know what plant they're on. You know, why is this insect on this plant? And so work your way, be a detective, put your Sherlock Holmes hat on and work your way backwards on this. And it's like, what insect is this? And why is it on this plant? Why does this plant have insects? And so insects are, are almost never the primary problem. They're usually the secondary or tertiary problem but they're almost never the primary problem. Mountain well, pine beetle epidemic, that was a little different story. But you gotta ask yourself, why does this plant have insects on it? Is the plant stressed? It's Wyoming, the plant is stressed, okay? <laughs> when was the last time I watered this plant? Did I over fertilize this plant? So you start asking yourself some basic, basic questions. If all you need to do is water the tree or the shrub or the plant and gets rid of the bugs, then you're on top of the game because now you're not putting chemicals into the environment. If your vegetable garden and you've got aphids or whatever, go back and start thinking, what have I fertilized with? Have I over fertilized? Did I use Miracle Grow? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wanted instant gratification, so I said, I'm going to use, yeah. So go back and because almost always when you start using a fertilizer, the fertilizer causes, and especially I'm going to pick on Miracle Grow because I like to pick on it. <laughs> um, it has too much nitrogen in it. And so that all that nitrogen tells that plant to grow and to grow a lot, right? Because it's all of a sudden you have that instant gratification. You've got a big, big plant now and it's green and it looks flush and it's the best plant on the block, but it's full of bugs. The nitrogen tells that plant to be more soft and succulent and sweet. And so it's going to be an, a natural magnet for insects, especially insects that like to, to suck or chew on the leaves. So you're gonna end up with a lot more aphids because you've over fertilized. So if you go back and go, oh yeah, I, I fertilized five days ago and now I've got an aphid infestation. Roses are notorious for that. Having an aphid infestation after being fertilized, lupins, columbines, all of them really get very sweet and succulent to insects because they've been over fertilized. So go back and then Water the plant really, really well and try to flush some of that fertilizer down and just hose the plant off with water. If that still doesn't work, so you're using that integrated pest management, you're working your way up the ladder. A couple days later, yeah, you still have an insect problem. That's where you're going to get maybe like a neem oil or something pretty benign, and then you spot spray that plant only. You don't spray everything, you just spray that plant. 
And then you wait and you see what happens because you don't want to have to keep repeat spraying and repeat spraying. You've got to change what you're, how you're managing that plant first. And then only spray if there's an indication of insects. And, and it, so I have, I have some issues with some of the um, corporate lawn care companies that push their people to spray everything. And they kind of scare homeowners and say, you need to spray your tree. You need to spray your tree to keep it healthy. And if you don't spray your tree, your tree's going to get sick. And I've, I've heard this tactic a number of times. I've seen some of the bills from, from that tactic. And I, and I always tell the homeowner, it's like, do you know what insect they're spraying? Well, no, they didn't tell me. Have you seen insects on your trees? Well, no. Then don't spray your tree. Just water it. So as, as master gardeners, you're going to be confronted with that question. Should I spray my tree? Or people look and go, oh, I have an apple tree and I've got to spray it. Okay. So you, you've got to kind of get people to back off that mentality of I've got to spray everything and start to teach them that, you know, you need to look at the whole thing synergistically. And let's start with water. Let's start with preventive methods instead of just a heavy hammer. So again, only if there's an indication of insects that need to be sprayed and if they're doing something bad and no other method has worked first. So thanks to protect, again, soil, water, air, plants, phytotoxicity, did a yard call a number of years ago in a apartment complex where the chemist, the, the guy who owned the apartment complex hated bugs, had the chemical company come out and spray everything and spray it hard. And the plants had phytotoxicity. And so phytotoxicity, the plant leaves turn yellow and then the margins turn black or the veins can turn black and then the intervenal areas can be yellow. So that's phytotoxicity. So you've got to be very careful with overspraying. And first, you kind of protect yourselves too. Because remember, this is, you know, a lot of these are neurotoxins, a lot of them are hormone disruptors, stomach poisons, muscle disruptors. So you've got to be very careful with you and don't take your pet with you. You have kids. I know there's days. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the other kind of touchy thing, GMOs, genetically modified plants, biotech crops. And I know that's a controversial area because a lot of people go, oh, you know, Frankenstein foods. Well, let's look at it from a couple different ways. A lot of times these technologies are, are nothing more than like a vaccine to that plant. So the plant now has resistance to a virus or a bacteria, or it's developed an ability to fend itself off better for something that wants to eat it, like, like um, corn earworms or corn rootworms or weevils. So again, this is from the EPA, well, International Federation or something. And they track pesticide use. And so since the biotech crops have come on, the amount of organophosphate insecticides and all of their insecticides, of organophosphate, which are very bad, has dropped hugely. So alone, Iowa alone has reduced their, their reliance on these pesticides, these insecticides, 46 million pounds less. That's huge. So now that you know how these insecticides work and the people problems and how they were developed, I mean, they're, they're, all of these chemical insecticides were derived from chemical warfare out of World War II. So they were targeted towards people, not insects. So now that you know how they use, they, they work. To have this much reduction is huge. And I'm sure since this chart came out that it's dropped even more. I have no problems, no qualms with crops that have got BTI in them or 
some some other natural product to um, naturally kill an insect that's going to eat them, if it means that they're getting organophosphate insecticides out of the environment. I think that's just huge. I think that outweighs a lot of the fears that have been mongered on the internet. Okay. So if you've got these chemicals in your garage or your garden shed and you're going, oh my heck, <laughs> yeah. Call the city of Cheyenne sanitation department. They take hazardous household waste, usually by appointment every Saturday. They give them a call and they'll dispose of it properly. They all can sleep for years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is it just a random fact? Yeah. yeah. I'm just seeing if you're still awake. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's my corgi sitting on the cat. <laughs> Who's not appreciating it at all. So let's take a break. <laughs> So the cat in the Orton's chair. What's that? Is the cat in the Orton's chair? No, the cat is in my chair. <laughs> uh, no, it's my chair. <laughs> <laughs> so I was in the parent center business in Lake Mills, which is Madison, and I spent most of the summer in the rest of the board coming together and making school parties. Oh, yeah. I I still have the I still have never had any sort of summer sauce to the as soon as I can Small independent things, they use them in their own. You want to come? You want to come help us with the test? <laughs> well, hey, I'm going to like to invite everybody, right? Not terribly sick. Okay. Oh, did you get one of these? No? Okay. Thank you. All right. I'll put this here in case I have a good experience. However long it takes. Hey, so yeah. it take that. Right, right. Hopefully it won't be bigger than the goes into one of the two. Yeah, yeah. 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 I went to sell my house in Kansas City. I went and I sprayed my yard. I waited a couple of weeks and I went out and sprayed it again. Right. Oh, I got that from just by chance. Right. Oh, okay. They're like nice. Yeah, um, 4, I got a creek that 
cuts across my property. So it stayed humid. They killed all the weeds and that yeah. grass sprouted yeah. up. It was just perfect. And the realtor, when I moved down here, the realtor goes, everybody, everybody comments back in the yard. <laughs> so I, was, I went to grass all the other day and I got like, did it. I'm going to make the same color. Okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I also kind of fertilized it a little bit too. So the okay. grass that was there was really good. Yeah. 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 And you do one by two. I think it helps. So eight feet long. Well, probably does. No, so it's going to be eight feet long. Okay. I, I've had a number of people over the years call me and with problems, with lawn problems or tree problems. And they're usually in a panic going, and I'm trying to sell the house and the tree looks really bad. Or the tree has dropped all its leaves or the tree has done something. And one lady had an elm tree and there was elm leaf beetle in there. And of course, it silicized the leaves. And she wanted to know what to do to get those leaves back so that we could have a bar. Yeah, next spring. spring. Yeah. But she was convinced that people would see that tree and not buy the house because it's a tree. Or maybe you could put on there. That helps. On a farm, just part of the farm. Yeah. Yeah. I stepped this dogwood tree. So then, when I opened it, it was the yard. I was okay. I'm going to start the plant. And I never got around the plant. No. I started just throwing dirt up against it. Then I had to build the barrier around it. So that the dirt was kind of creeping strong. Just put it on the ground and move it back. I have to tell you, my grandmother believed in her black woman, looked at her whatever her spring, but she didn't until she was nine. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. You know, and a doctor, part of the problem a friend that I went to high school and he had kind of like so they stay here. And yeah, 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 that's yeah. that's the, yeah. the, the downside is no water because, because I had one have it. here no. years ago. And they didn't have the same. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, well, this is the job. I'm going to test it on the other side. The last one I had, I'm a Oh, I see. 
Yeah, my husband loves to fish, and so he's always bringing walleye to him. And he's fish is primarily just kind of me. I think it's the queen of the I raise all my own vegetables and I raise my own beef and my own lamb. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's interesting. And I I run into a lot of stuff in my dad.
I have choke cherries all over the place. I have like five choke cherries, large bushes, and the master bush has like so many suckers coming all over the place. That's amazing. So on the Emma Ancher, you should be able to take his feet. Okay, so let's um, we're kind of on the home stretch here for this class. There are definitely better ways to control insects. And again, to really promote the IPM approach, starting with the least toxic problem first. So ID the problem, you know, ID that plant, ID the pest. So know, know who your customer is and, and why. Start with the least toxic solution first, beneficial insects, water the tree, water the plants, a fertilizer, biopesticides, give it some time. And then a lot of times when you use soft methods, you have to use a little more persistence and especially with weeds. And a lot of people, you know, well, how do you control bindweed? Persistence. How do you control thistle? Uh, persistence. So you just have to keep at it. There's no one single magic wand that's going to take care of some of these things. So biorational insecticides, and that's that, we'll see the um, NOLO bait that I passed around, or that, yeah, this, that can be considered biorational because it's very specific to that insect. It's very selective to grasshoppers and Mormon crickets. Nothing else, just that. Biorational insecticides are starting to become more and more popular, especially in the nursery industry, the ornamental plant industry, because they're a little less expensive. It has better PR, which is important to the nurseries. And it's very specific to that insect. So non-target insects, so animals are not affected or very little. What do you mean? If you use the, the grasshopper killer, the grasshopper see each other and there's dead grasshopper, the birds eat them. Did the birds get poison then? Okay, so the question is if the grasshoppers eat the nolo bait, and then because grasshoppers are cannibalistic, right, and they'll eat each other, does that that dead grasshopper or the still live grasshopper cause problems if a bird eats it? No. No. Because it's very specific to the grasshoppers. Yep. And, and I use this and then I let my chickens loose and the chickens are fine. Bacillus thuringinus, that's your mosquito dunk. So when you go to the hardware store or the feed store, 
you could buy those those brown donut looking things. They're hard as a rock, right? And so we throw them in creeks or rivers or streams and they go after the larva of mosquitoes and black flies, midges. And there's a couple other bad guys that they go very specifically after, but those three are the big ones. And you can use them, oh, fungus gnats, fungus gnats. You can put it in your watering can for your house plants if you have fungus gnats. And then every time you water your house plants, you're watering it with some BTI, Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, it's um, Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis. And that will take out the fungus gnats in your house plants too. So it's very effective on mosquito larvae. Um, Avermectin, spinosad, azadectrin, mycoinsecticides, uh, Bulbaria bassiana. So those are all, you can buy all these, you know, and, and they're, they're very low toxicity, so they have very high LD50 number. Spinosad, though, some caution to that, that is derived from lilies, and the bad guys can develop resistance to spinosad over time. I think this is my, my sense of humor, right? From a plant's point of view, many insects are nothing more than dangerous leaf eating parasites that should die. <laughs> so, plants produce insecticides like caffeine and nicotine to keep those obnoxious six legged vegetarians away. They also produce pesticides to keep the furry four legged vegetarians away, too. So, this is by Alex um, Rizzo. And uh, pesticides we eat are produced by plants themselves. So very interesting. Take on plants. And plants also have a lot of some pretty wicked toxicity to them. So know your plants, know your herbs before you eat them. So don't, don't make an assumption that because it's no, an herb, it's okay, well. right? Yeah. <laughs> know your plants, know your plants. Um, so plant-derived pesticides. So now we're gonna talk about the tonicals or essential oils. So essential oils, again, go back to Susan Allen's lecture. You know, you wanna be very careful with it because it's a very concentrated form out of that plant. Steam distillation or other process from plants, leaves, flowers, or seeds. Can act as insect growth regulators, anti-feeding, molting, respirator inhibitors. Growth and cuticle disruptors. So, so just because it's botanical doesn't necessarily mean that it's benign. So be very careful when you use plant-derived insecticides or essential oils. They do work, but make sure you're, you know, what you're using. <laughs> Diseases formulated as sprays, usually non-toxic to mammals. Not systemic, can be consumed by the insect or caterpillar. Not persistent. Again, the noble bait is not persistent. The environment breaks down very quickly. That bag, you know, when they when you, you get it, they tell you to use it that season because it, it dies very quickly. And that's why it's here, because it's no good anymore. Okay, so milky spore disease, that's been used since 1948 for Japanese beetle grubs. They have found Japanese beetles in Scott's Bluff. And I know they're in Fort Collins. They yeah. found them up in Sheridan. They're in Illinois a lot. Yeah, I've been in Missouri where they, you know, bombarded me sitting underneath a tree. Yeah. Yeah. But they're they're nasty and they will eat anything, eat anything. And so they're very destructive to crops. But the milky spore disease is the best defense against them. Brucillus thuringiensis crustacei. This is a this is a great one for on your vegetables for going after larva. If a larva would like to drill the little holes in your cabbage or that you find in your broccoli after you've steamed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's an insect there floating upside down, but 
So this is this is kind of good for um, caterpillars, worms, those kind of guys. Again, it's not not toxic. It's not persistent in the environment. It's not going to go after non-target insects. Uh, Brasilis, uh, San Diego, larva of the Colorado potato beetle, elm leaf beetles. Oh, the Colorado potato beetle will make you crazy on your potatoes. Um, Wolveria bassiana, you know, mass, uh, Nosema lopestii, um, you know, polyhedros virus, for gypsy moth control. That's gypsy moth is, is a problem with pine trees, logical pines, and ponderosas. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, we have an outbreak of that. I haven't seen that in a long time. But just know that there are some non toxic approaches to controlling some very bad insects. Ants. And a lot of different ways to control ants. You use repellents, vinegar, cayenne pepper, citric acid, extracts, bone meal, cinnamon. Cinnamon in concentrated enough, like those red hots, like you take a whole bag of red hots and boil them down and concentrate them, is a type of cinnamon formaldehyde. Yes. Cinnamon can be a poison by itself. So it's very effective. How about the cinnamon stick? Can you use a stick? Not the powder, but the stick. Yeah. No. It, it's got to be, yeah, you've got to have it as a concentrate. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So the trick with ants getting rid of ants is to kill the queen. Mm -hmm. Kill the queen. You kill the queen, you, you kill the nest. So those little tiny ants, those little kind of sugar ants, little tiny ants, the, the best poison that I have found for them that is very specific to them is aspartame. <laughs> it's originally developed as an ant poison. <laughs> I had to do some really deep digging on the internet to find that. It was originally what? Hmm? It was originally what? It was originally developed as an ant poison. That's what it was developed for. Yeah. yeah. Right. So it's an artificial sweetener. And dilute concentration, it's great in sodas. But if you take a little packet of equal, you know those little blue packets, and you just sprinkle it on that ant mound. So that, I get them once in a while on my high tone. Or my best wear. I'll just take a little packet of equal and sprinkle it on there. And they're gone the next day. They're gone. Non, non toxic to anything else, targets specifically to the ants. Kale and clay. So you can buy kale and clay. You can go up to natural grocers and buy kale and clay in a bottle. It's used um, toothpaste. Um, antacids, that sort of thing. But you can spray it on like apples or um, peppers. One will help prevent sunburn. But it also, it's, it forms that clay forms of, of film. And when something tries to bite into it like a grip, it literally breaks the jaw of that insect. So it, it's not really a poison per se, right? It's not a poison, but it damages the insect in a, in a way that it can no longer feed. You can buy this as a product called Surround. It's used a lot in the organic food industry. Organic apple orchards use this a lot. And so it's very benign. You wash it off, it's, you know, it's clay. So it controls leaf hoppers, leaf rollers, suppresses mites, codling moth grips from Coca-Cola, stink bugs, apple maggots, reduces heat stress on the fruit, prevents fruit drop, sunburn, does a whole bunch of other stuff. And you can buy it. Probably have to buy it on, you know, go to Amazon, buy it on Amazon, right? Yeah, where else? Where else?
Okay, neem oil, as a decrim indica. This is a tree that's grown in India. Principal active ingredients, as a dactrin. <clears throat> 25 other active compounds have been isolated. It has many modes of action. So it's very hard because of all of these different ways it works and can work on an insect. It's very hard for that insect to develop resistance to it. So it can interfere with egg laying, the way it grows, retardants, the sterile, the red toxins. And because it just works so differently, the insects don't develop resistance to it. For the most part, it should be a contact spray, unless that is an insect that likes to eat plants. And so then that plant, that insect will eat it and then die from it. So it's not many modes, it also makes it non-targeted. So it yes, it's everything. <laughs> yep. It will take out the good guys, good guys. So it'll take out your bees, your bumblebees, your lace wings, butterflies. It'll take anything out. So you, when you use it, there's a problem right there, and so you've got to be very selective with how you apply it. Smell sad. So I do, I do use spinosad now and then. Um, trying to get rid of, I hate having worms on my cabbage. It's from a squirrel dwelling bacterium called Sacropolyspora spinosa. Poses less of a risk to, risk to most, in, risk the most insecticides to birds, fish, mammals. You know, your dogs, your cats. And unique mode of action, a high degree of activity on target pests and low toxicity to non target organisms. So, that low toxicity is really important. And then, I, I've had people call and want to know what insecticide to kill one insect with. And then they'll end it with, but I want this to be really fast and humane to kill this bug. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom of my shoe is fast and humane too. <laughs> so that's why I put this here. Kills the insect within minutes. So it's very fast. And again, it is a neurotoxin. It also has a neurotoxin. Diet Smesha Earth, we talked about this one. Non-toxic to mammals, non-toxic to you. It's not going to be toxic in the environment. Garlic, this is garlic is used a lot in the organic cropping groups. It, it's uh, non-selective. So you have to do your due diligence to make sure that you're spraying what needs to be sprayed and not just random spraying. And you can make your own. You've got to get the smelliest, strongest bulb of garlic you can find, a quart of water, toss it in the blender for five minutes, and then you can dilute it to one gallon and then spray it on the plant that's got insects. So if you've got a rose bush and it's got aphids on it, you can make this and then just spray those aphids. It works on it works on some weevils because they use it with the organic. Sunflowers. And you, use, it, you can buy it already made. It's easy to find from um, pile, pile garlic or something like that. But you can find you can find garlic as an insecticide on online pretty easily. Um, also repels, presses mosquitoes, aphids, caterpillars, white flies, mites, and some beetles. But speaking of beetles. Yeah, the smaller the garlic, the better. So Yvonne asked me a break about flea beetles. And flea beetles come in all sorts of sizes and colors. And so they can be 
long and skinny, they could be short and fat, they could be striped, they could be red, they could be black. And they're they're everywhere. They're very hard to control. In fact, I'm not even going to tell you to try to spray for them because you can't. And so these are the little bugs that are going to eat a hole in, you know, just usually a little circular hole in the leaf. A number of years ago, CSU was doing some research in beetles. And, and actually, I think that they were doing research on a different insect, but they got a little airplane and they got a drag, a, an insect dragnet. And so they were flying at different altitudes, catching bugs. They're probably a Whitney finish off them. So, <laughs> yeah, if you know Whitney, he's, 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 he's cool. And they went all the way up to 10,000 feet. And at every level, they found flea beetles. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say don't even try, because you're, you're not going to win the war with flea beetles. You know, they're finding like 10,000 feet above the earth. The best you can do is just sort of sprinkle a little diatomaceous syrup on your plants. And as they crawl along, if they're going to chew on that plant, then you know, when they hit that, that DE, you know, it's, it's, it's going to do them quite a bit of damage. You can try spraying surround on, on your plants too that you don't want eaten, but, you know, there's, there's ways. But flea beetles, you know, you're just not going to win that war. Okay. Boron, boric acid, borax, 20 mule tea, borax. Works as a stomach poison. So this is actually works for ants. If you got the real big ants or an ant pile or whatever you're trying to get rid of, it takes five to 10 days, has a lethal dose of 3,200. So it's it's pretty low toxic. You're, you know, people worry about their kids getting into it or animals getting into it. There, there's nothing there that's gonna attract an animal to wanna eat that. Little kids, on the other hand, <laughs> I'm gonna pick on I'm gonna pick on little boys because this is something my brother did. My mom had lindane and she was going after the ants in the lawn, and so she was sprinkling lindane on all the ant hills. And my little brother, you know, about you know six years old at that time, he's following my mom. Actually, he was younger than that. He had to be like two or three. And he licked his fingers and he put it down on that ant hill and he would take that powdered sugar up and he was eating it as he was going along because he thought it was something to eat. It's a little boy. <laughs> but other than that, I'm going to say that for the most part, animals and kids are going to leave this alone because it just isn't going to have that palatability to it. Thin film, the insect picks it up on its legs. And then as they groom themselves, they ingest it. So this is why it takes a long time to work because for ants, you're just killing off the worker ants. And so the queen is gonna make more worker ants. So you've gotta get that poison down to the nest and get the queen to eat it. And that's how you're gonna take them out. So that's that's the more of the challenge with using borax. You can make a solution for it. You know, put it in solution and pour it on the ant hill. That works. You can just sprinkle it out there. Pesticidal soaps. There's a pesticidal soap out there called Safer Soap, and that works pretty well. That is um, pretty benign. I've used it off label on fungus on powdery mildew, and it works on powdery mildew. Very off label. It acts as a suffocant. So you spray it on the insect, it can't breathe. Uh, it also dissolves into the membranes around the cell, resulting in dehydration of that insect. But again, the insect, you have to actually direct contact that insect with that safer soap or that insecticidal soap. You can make your own. You just have to be very, very careful with it. You can take a little bit of your liquid detergent, um, two tablespoons of liquid detergent to a gallon of water. And you can spray that for insects, you know, aphids, works well on aphids. 
but don't make it any stronger than that because it also can become a herbicide. And that's not good. You want to spray it when temperatures are no higher than 85 degrees, preferably cooler. You don't ever want to spray a stress for wilted plants. That's just going to take the plant out. So they don't work. These pesticidal soaps, these pesticidal soaps don't work on beetles. They don't work on anything that's got a hard exoskeleton. So a beetle isn't going to, it's not going to be effective on it. And there's just not that many beetles that, that you really need to take out. Most, most beetles are good guys. Traps. Again, sticky traps, we talked a little bit about those. Those are, um, I talked about the yellow sticky traps, yellow sticky cards. Mm -hmm. And insects are really attracted to yellow. And so if you put some sticky stuff on there, you'll, you'll be able to do a whole entomology class just on your sticky card in the summer or in the vegetable garden. You can buy these. They're, again, you're going to have to most likely go online to find them. The ones for trees, you know, people are always worried about worms in their apples, which is justifiable. But you want a pheromone trap in your, in your apple tree. So you want to hang, there's a tent that you can hang with the pheromone inside of it, and the moth flies in there and gets stuck to it. There's the round sticky ones that are red, look like an apple, they fly to it, stick to it. And that's by far a better method of controlling the moths that lay the eggs that become coddling moths. Okay. People are going to ask you what to spray their apple trees with, and you're going to say nothing. Because as soon as they start spraying their apple trees, apple trees are 100% dependent on bees to pollinate them. And if they spray their apple trees, they're going to kill the pollinators. And, you know, you're always kind of going backwards on that. So, pheromone traps are by far the best approach. Easy to get. Well, I have to go online, but they're, they should be readily available. Okay, horticulture oils, again, that, this is what got passed around. I think there's better ways to use, you know, to control scale insects. And if you're using a petroleum product, there's cheaper ways to go. You know, make your own insecticidal soap and just dab it on the scale insects. Canola oil, canola oil. It is listed as a biopesticide. So you can literally take canola oil, put it on a sponge, and put it on scale insects or whatever, and suffocate them, spray canola oil on aphids or whatever is annoying that plant. So it's listed as a biopesticide. Corn oil is also listed as a minimum risk pesticide. So again, you can spray that on a plant. Direct contact though, it's gotta be directly on that insect to work. So if you just spray it there and there's no insects, you're probably feeding the ants. Yeah. Okay, we talked about the spotted wing drosophila and little trap that you can use. You can buy sugar alcohol put in here. There, so there's a, a couple ways to do this. You can even spray them with that sugar alcohol, but they've got to be present when you're spraying. I I just I just tell people, put these little traps. I tell them how to make one out of a little party cup, red party cup. And then enjoy the raspberries, but don't look closely. <laughs> Beneficial insects. You can buy all these insects. You can go online and order them and buy them. Ladybugs, bee wastelings, praying mantis, nematodes. There's good nematodes to go after bad nematodes. But you have to know first that you've got a bad nematode problem before you get good nematodes. So that helps now. Turkey gamma wasps, these, these guys are amazing. 
when we first bought the property that we had out in Carpenter, it had been used for a while as a cattle feedlot and a backgrounding for calves. And the fly problem was just bigger. And it took me about two years using the perfect animal loss to knock it down by almost 95%. Really, really worked out very well. I didn't have to spray, I didn't do anything. I just sprinkled the little larva casings out and they hatched and went after the maggots. And with this guy, this is Bombylius major. It's actually a fly and it's a bee fly. <clears throat> so this long, Thing coming off of its face. It's not a stinger, doesn't bite, doesn't do anything. It's called proboscis, so it's just a claw, and it's a nectar drinker. So it's going to go to flowers and look for nectar. But I put Bombylius major here because this is a fly that is parasitic to aphids. And so she'll lay her eggs where there's aphids at. And then those eggs hatch to larva, and the larva eat the aphids. So it's a very benign little insect, but very sensitive to insecticides. You cannot buy them, unfortunately. But if you put in enough nectar flowering plants, he will fill up. Yeah. I'm way out on the prairie. I have those guys, and they just showed up. If you build a flowering buffer, where you've got something flowering from April to October, and you have a variety of flowering plants, you will attract a whole bunch of beneficial insects, these guys, and they will keep the world in balance, and they will take out the bad guys, and they will keep the bad guys in check. And the whole time in the whole years, all the years I've lived out here, I've never really had a bad insect problem in my vegetable garden or any place really on the property that warranted spraying. But I try to maintain that flowering buffer or flowering island so that these guys have a support system and I don't have to do anything. I like that. I don't have to do anything. They're working for me. That way I can enjoy my vegetable garden and my flower garden. I need to go do something else. And I'm not putting chemicals into the environment. So places to buy insects. There's a whole bunch more insectaries than just this list here. I think if you went online, you'd probably find a lot more. There's an insectary up in Montana, and they raise insects that go after weeds. So you can have insects that not only attack other bugs, but you can get insects that go after weeds. So there's some insects that will go after toad flax and thistle and um, oh, a whole bunch of others. They're working on an insect that goes after bindweed, but they haven't been hugely successful with that one. And I will get this lecture to you all. I'll um, email it out. <clears throat> so now we're going to jump over to herbicides. And this is a pretty short little lecture here. So herbicides work in a number of different ways on the plants. But again, they're almost always some sort of hormone disruptor. And so everyone kind of looks at herbicides as being kind of benign, but they're really not. So amino acid synthesizers, inhibitors, cell membrane disruptors, growth regulators, lipid synthesis inhibitors, photosynthetic inhibitors, seed growth, and I mean, let's go on, and then unclassified. That's always the scary area where it's unclassified. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Roundup blocks critical respiration enzyme pathways. So it blocks that respiration ability in the plant. And it can knock the plant up really quickly. 
For a lot of people, it's usually not fast enough, but that's how Roundup works. And again, that inner ingredients in Roundup is just to help the glyphosate stick to the plant. Okay, herbicides in the cell membrane disruptors are post-emergent contact herbicides. So that means that the plant has already germinated and it's popped up and it's in a still in a very small growth state. So it's got the true leaves, but it's still growing. So that's post-emergent, activated by sunlight to form active compounds that disrupt the plant cells, causing disintegration of cell membranes and chloroplasts. And this can work on a bright sunny day in just a couple hours, so it's fast. And in 2,4-D, finally taken up through the leaves, interferes with various biological activities and protein synthesis of the plants. 2,4-D is used a lot in weed and feed formulas. And if it's applied on a hot day, or in a morning where it's going to become a hot day. This will volatilize off the soil and becomes kind of a vapor, and it's kind of an invisible vapor, and it will drift. And if you've got grapes or tomato plants, just, just the vapors of 2,4-D will take out your grapes and your tomato plants. And it, and it takes the leaves and, and it causes them to curl and cup in. And so when you see that on a plant, you know that's herbicide damage. The leaf should be out like this. Herbicide damage is going to cause it to do this. Linden trees are especially sensitive to 2,4-D. It's really sensitive to it. Okay, cord gluten meal. Depends upon who you talk to about this. Um, my counterpart at UW, Chris Hilger, did some work on it back in Oregon. So think wet, constantly wet, mossy country, and he said corn gluten meal didn't work back there. I've had master gardeners use this in their lawn, and they just love it. And I know some lawn care companies that use it. So this is got to be applied twice a year in the early in the spring. So it goes after your winter annuals. You know, annuals that like to germinate in 45 degree temperatures. So it works on, on those cool season annuals the best. 20 pounds per thousand square feet. It's again another one of those where I'm going to tell you to have patience with it because it takes time. But once you apply it, it's active in the soil for about four weeks. So you can't put it down in your vegetable garden and then come back in and seed your vegetable garden and go, it's growing. Well, corn gluten meal is good for four weeks. So it's in the soil for a month. So apply it early in the spring in your lawn, late in the fall on your lawn, 10% nitrogen. So this is an all natural weed and feed. Vinegar. So those weeds that grow on the cracks of the sidewalk make a lot of people crazy. They get the ground up out or weed be gone or water knows what. Just take some plain old white vinegar, go to Sam's Club and buy the two gallons for five bucks and go out on the hot time of the day, you know, two in the clock, two in the afternoon, and just pour that vinegar on those weeds in the crack. And they will be dead within a couple hours. It just burns up. It absolutely burns them. I've used, um, well, a friend of mine used the horticulture grade vinegar, which is 20%, on puncture vine. It had a complete knockdown on it. 5% vinegar will knock down lectin thistle, which is pretty impressive. The only problem, you know, lectin thistle is perennial, so it's going to come back. So persistence, you have to keep hitting it. Now, vinegar is non-selective. So be very careful. It works great on the sidewalk where you're trying to get the weeds going and you crash the sidewalks. 
and if you're using your lawn, you will take out everything that it touches because it's not selected and it just burns everything. But again, it doesn't take out the roots on the bring it to eat. And thistle, if any of your perennial weeds are going to be tougher to control because, again, they have a different physiology. And so there's a couple times to go after them. Most people miss those windows. When you miss the window and then weeds are herbicide resistant, they're stressed. And so they're resistant and they're stressed to become resistant. In the spring, when you first find them, when you first see them, and so you have to be able to identify a lot of those weeds when they're just bitty bitty. It's like Russian thistle, which is your tumbleweed. Looks like leathery blades of grass. That's the time to hit it is then for your toad flax and your thistle. You need to spray it when it's blooming because it's spending a lot of energy to bloom. It takes 20% of its energy just to bloom. So it's going to be more receptive to taking stuff down. And then the next best time, actually the best time to get weeds, these perennial weeds, is in the fall after the first frost. So frost comes through, then you go out there and you can hit it with, with something like 2,4-D or Banville, you know, something that's not hugely toxic but very selective. The plant takes that into its leaves, sends it down to the roots, and it doesn't come back the next spring. The timing is everything. If you try to spray them, you go, oh, it's a hot day. Uh, you know, these plants are stressed. You know, this is really going to get them. You know, they're herbicide resistant at that point. And, and so once they get to a certain size, after, especially after bloom, they're herbicide resistant. So get them in the fall. Okay. And this is my favorite grasshopper control method. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So they used to raise turkeys and they would go on a patrol. They'd go all the way down to Crow Creek. Then they'd hike back up. They'd go up to the top of the pivot to our alfalfa field and come all the way back home. And so they would walk a mile, mile and a half a day. And they have, and I have a livestock garden dog that would follow them along, you know, like one of little turkeys, but here I am. They are lousy flyers. And they would <laughs> jump off that roof and just kind of go squat. <laughs> but turkey, but grasshopper eating machines. Yep. And then they fertilize as they go. That'd be beautiful. Hmm? That'd be beautiful for arable water. Oh, they can go up behind it and just walk up because it's built into the side of the hill. That particular building is you know, built into the hill. Or just walk up, get up there, and go. Oh, I'm lost. How do I get down? Ah. Yeah. It's kind of like the bug that crawls into here. They found the door to get in, but they can't find the door to get out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thoughts, questions? This this is kind of a tough lecture because it's a little dry, and so I try not to make it too painful. <laughs> but again. Integrated pest management, sort of the least toxic with the way of identify the pest, identify the plant, try to figure out why that plant is having insect problems. What was the fertilizer? What's the water? What's the temperature of? How's the weather been? It's been hot, dry, and windy. And did the owner fertilize that tree or whatever shrub two days ago and now and didn't water it and now it's hot, dry, and windy? Oops. So, yeah, be a detective. Detective. And it stops snowing. It's Wednesday. <laughs> it's snowing. It's Wednesday. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, drive safe. Have a safe trip home. And for everybody who's online, thanks for hanging out with us. And uh, see you next time. Okay, so Dave, cheatgrass, cheatgrass and annual, it's uh, Germany, it's at 45 degrees, so you have to spray in October, November. Yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah, vinegar, vinegar's non-selective, but it will take it out. Yep.
everybody have a good night.